Hello Sounds and good. good afternoon out there, big time small firm. I'm Jeff Stafford at Modus Operandi Design, and today is part one of uh, Hangout regarding custom homes. Uh, don't miss part two, which is going to be this coming Wednesday at 9 o'clock p.m. Um, today we have with us uh, Mark LePage, who is the owner with his wife Anne Marie of uh, Five Cat Studio in Pleasantville, New York. Uh, as well as leading up Entrepreneur Architect, which is a very uh, extensive research for any uh, architects who are in business for themselves. Uh, also with us today to talk custom homes is Gregory Lavardera of uh, Lamy Designs, which is the online leader of modern house plans. And he's out of, uh, is it Merkinsville, New Jersey, Gregory? Mer Merchantville, New Jersey. It's a, right outside Philadelphia. All right. Well, very good. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and dive into our discussion here. Uh, we're not going to get into some of the uh, some of the things that you're used to hearing around custom, you know, home building in this time. Maybe like the the way the economy is and uh, the some of the rote uh, arguments that you see on you know some of the discussion boards about home builders versus architects or uh, home designers versus architects. We'll touch on those, but I, I want to keep it flowing and, and give a good broad view of since these two guys are leaders in, in home design, which is such a small, uh, by architects that is, which is such a small part of the total home design market. Uh, I want to get a, a broad overview, and, and then, of course, if anybody wants to get in touch with them, uh, I'm going to post links to their website, 5cat.com and uh, lemmydesign.com, where uh, you can go check out their work in more detail. And, uh, of course, always feel free to contact them here at Big Time Small Firm. So, first of all, I wanted to ask each of you to give me a, uh, a basic uh, overview of, of your practice and just tell us kind of what drives you when you're working on home design with a client starting with Mark. Okay, um, Five Cat Studio, we're about 40 minutes north of New York City in Westchester, New York. Uh, our market is mostly, it's very residential, uh, pretty suburban, sort of suburban moving into like the woods kind of thing. Um, and uh, mostly older homes, uh, homes that are similar to the ones on the screen right now. Uh, that's a turn of the century house that we did a, a small kitchen addition on in the back. Um, and most of our work is additions and renovations. Um, we do some new homes, but the majority of our work is, uh, is um, additions and alterations. What drives us is, uh, is working with our clients. We, have, we don't really focus on a specific style uh, we have a pretty diverse portfolio, uh, but we work mostly toward uh, very focused on making sure the, the overall experience of the project uh, with the client is handled well. Um, and so that's really our, our main focus uh, from, a, from a firm. That's kind of what sets us apart is the, is the process that we've developed. Okay. And um, how about a, a little bit about Entrepreneur Architect and how that came about, Mark? Sure, Entrepreneur Architect. I, I started as a blog back in 2007, uh, sort of a personal blog where I just kind of wanted to have a place where I can uh, send links and just kind of write uh, thoughts. And it's it's really mostly focused on uh, the business of architecture. Business is is sort of a passion of mine, and and the concept of how to how to make a successful architecture firm. And this past December, I've uh, I relaunched it. Uh, as a as a true resource for architects, uh, and the intent is to grow it into something that's you know uh, influential in the profession where people go there uh, to to find what they need to learn the things that were not taught in schools uh, to 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 basically inspire and and teach architects to be better business people. That's great, Mark. I really want to say thank you. It's it's helped me out a lot just getting started in the past couple of years, and I purchased your foundations package, 
and uh, that supplemented what I already had just from working in other firms. So uh, I really appreciate what you're doing there at Entrepreneur Architect. You're welcome. Gregory. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I'm uh, – listening to Mark sounds very similar. I started <clears> – <throat> started my, my office with my wife who's an interior designer so we had complementary practices and uh, <clears throat> we're right outside of Philadelphia um, <clears throat> locally um, most of my my work is uh, similar to Mark's in that uh, residential some like commercial um, in residential we do a lot of renovations and additions uh, with local clients some new houses um, uh, but not not as many houses as uh, as uh, as renovations and additions. That that's a um, much more uh, of our workflow. Um, I, I don't know if that's partially because of our region. I mean, similar to where Mark is, we're in an area that's very developed. Um, there are new houses that are built here with you know all of the the you know national. Um, you know, large merchant builders, but um, there's so much more of uh, clientele that are modifying or altering their homes compared to, you know, building new homes. It's not like a part of the country where residentially we're growing at a, at a, a fast pace and there's a lot of new construction. <clears throat> so I think that's a pretty common characteristic of, of uh, small firms that are located near, um, you know, established uh, metropolitan areas. Um, oh, there's my blog. <laughs> So the other um, the other part of my business uh, is um, is house plans, which I, I market uh, and sell online. That's something that came about in the early 2000s. Um, I I was v very interested in Dwell Magazine when it started publishing back then, and got involved online with their message board. And and through that, I sort of discovered that well, there's this whole subculture of homeowners that are very interested in modern houses, um, who really don't have a place to turn in the market. Um, and uh, so I started thinking about, well, how can how can we as a profession start to serve these serve these individuals? It's like a niche that was being unserved by the housing market. For better or worse, I, I took up house plans as a way to deliver design, you know, to that market. It's a way that the housing industry contractors they all understand purchasing house plans and building a house from them. So it seemed it seemed a way that you know worked with the existing um, business structures of the industry. Um, except I could introduce contemporary modern designs that look like a you know custom house into that um, into that kind of business flow and and um, that actually proved to be you know very successful. People understood the idea right away. Now um, at another level, I, I, I feel you know architects should be looking for ways to influence the wider housing market and. House plans is, is one thing that I found myself able to do. I don't necessarily believe that's the only answer or the best answer. It was the most obvious, the most obvious strategy when, when I started thinking about it. But I, I think as a profession, we, one of the things we need to put our creativity to is to, to finding other solutions for, um, for entering the wider housing market with better design. You know, <clears throat> the, so the nitty having, gritty. Having said that, Greg, uh, the next question I have for you is: What theories have have become more of a mantra for you, or maybe uh, some underlying values that that run from project to project and and show up? Well, the house plans are like a completely different animal from <clears throat> my local practice. I mean. With the the house plans, they're, they're I'm cultivating a brand and a style where uh, there's sort of a consistency from house to house, and you can sort of look at them and they all feel like they're of a family. Um, <clears throat> Mark, being a car guy, I, I could use like the analogy of like, you know, say a BMW. You look at a BMW, and all their models have a similar you know face on them. They all have a similar grill, and you know what kind of car that is um, when you see it. So. So the house designs in the house plan collection sort of follow that. There's there's certain architectural cues and and um, you know architectural moves that are used to to uh, to solve problems that are consistent from house to house, even though the houses are very different and they're designed for different situations. My local practice isn't like that at all. I mean, my local practice, I don't. I don't bring that stylistic bias, uh, you know, to the client. And some clients have sought me out because they found me online and they're aware of that other work. Um, 
but for the most part, um, for my local clients, I you know look to meet them at you know where their interests are, the kinds of houses that they like, the styles that they like, and actually having having house plans to work on in a you know completely self-driven manner. I mean, that, that would really change my attitude towards practice in that way because I have this thing over here where I'm sort of dreaming up and designing things you know very willfully and prior to that that was that was sort of a dimension of the way I designed with my local clients is that I, I was always seeking to um, you know find a place to apply these ideas that I had been formulating over you know over years and and my clients projects were a place you know perhaps to execute them but once I had this whole other laboratory, so to speak, to, to sort of expunge those ideas and, and follow them through, I really didn't find I had that agenda with my local clients anymore. Now I just felt completely free to deal with my clients on, you know, on their terms and find solutions that were you know, completely appropriate to them. So um, it was very liberating to sort of have this other design laboratory and not have to carry uh, another agenda on trying to uh, find design solutions for my local clients. That's great. So it's a it's a client centric uh, design process when you're dealing with somebody that comes to you locally and and you get yeah. to really flex <clears throat> your muscles, your design muscles on on your pre-designed home plan selection. Yeah. Well, I get to really set set the agenda on the um, the house plans and um, which is great. But with with my clients, then you know. It's it's more about that service oriented design where where you get inside their heads and try to figure out you know. Bit of an audio. Yeah, my band my bandwidth isn't so hot here. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Test test. Yeah, you came back. You're you're there. Uh, so the same question for for Mark too. You know what what's the underlying uh, design uh, theory that that has become kind of a mantra for Five Cat Studio? And what what design values uh, permeate through, throughout your work, Mark? Sure. I think the one thing that really uh, is a is a consistency is authenticity. Um, our work is very diverse, so so we don't really have a specific style. Uh, we actually have a lot more modern work than most architects in Westchester. There's not very much modern work to be had, and we've been lucky enough to do uh, a few projects that are modern. So when people are looking for modern work. Um, they're calling us, and so we're loving that. We love doing modern work. Um, we really love any, any residential project. Um, it's just something that's near and dear to, to Anne Ray and myself. Um, and so, uh, but I think authenticity and, and, and real materials and, and uh, very specific details are all things that, that people have come to know us for. Um, but I think, like I said before, I think the one thing that really is uh, sets us Part is that we really look at the each project as an experience from a from a client's point of view. That when they come to an architect at the level that we're designing, they expect us to design great architecture, and so we have to provide that as sort of the baseline. And what really separates us from other firms is that we really take our clients' hands from the very beginning all the way through to the very end, um, and and help them. Uh, collect their thoughts and collect their ideas. We have an entire pre-design process that we go through that includes questionnaires and, and image folders and meetings. And even before we ever design anything, we, we have you know uh, probably several weeks worth of work that we do of existing condition uh, collection and, and, uh, and meetings to get to the point where when we do design, we know we're designing the project that, that a client wants. And it's not always a client. It's not always a project that the client expects, um, because we go through this process and clients, residential clients especially, uh, by the time they get to the architect, they have they have a very strong idea about what they want. They've been thinking about it for a very long time. By the time they get to us, they just want to go. Um, but what we do is we kind of help them kind of go back a little bit and kind of collect their thoughts, make sure that they understand what they really want and help them communicate that to us. And so uh, we have that process put in place. So by the time we do design, we're bringing them something that they're really looking for. And then we work with them all the way through the project, all the way through to the very end of construction uh, to make sure that they're being uh, handled well and that they're, they're happy throughout the process. Uh, and because we look at every project as, as really a marketing opportunity for the next project. 
Right. Yeah. If there's uh, any way those of you who are watching can go back to uh, Noved and uh, watch the hangout that Mark LePage, uh, Neil Pan, and uh, what was the lady's name? Uh, that uh, Ar Aurora. Um, I can't pronounce her last name offhand. I have to read it. But her, her first name is Aurora. Young lady who started her firm right out of school. I'm oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Audrey Sato. Yeah, Audrey, Audrey Sato. That's yep. Yep. And, and Aurora was the hostess Correct, for yep. uh, Noveg. Um, but yeah, that was uh, one thing that you really touched on in, in good detail. That would that would be a great uh, hangout to watch on YouTube, on Noveg's YouTube channel if you haven't caught it already. Um, so <clears throat> what do you think... And, there's themes that are going to sort of repeat themselves here, but I'm, I'm sure that we can add a little more meat to the bones of, of these discussion points. But um, tell us about uh, what separates a nice custom home uh, by a builder or a home designer from, from those that are done by architects. You want Greg or me? Go ahead, Mark. Um, I think really the, the thing that separates houses designed by architects over houses designed by builders is that process that architects go through. Um, that a custom home that's designed specifically for a family or, or a client, um, that's, that's, that architects take the time to go through uh, and understand how a client lives, uh, what their background is, what their, their prior experiences are, what their desires are. Um, the things that they like and the things that they don't like. Um, so when they do design the project, every every room, every detail is designed around that specific family and how that specific family lives. Um, builders don't do that typically. Um, builders typically take a plan that they have used before and modify it to a client's desires if they have a, a client. If they don't, they're just building what the market typically bears and uh, and builds the thing that the, the, the greatest majority of the market wants to buy uh, or is perceived to want to buy um, and so you know there's a big big difference between a, a house designed by an architect and a house designed or not designed but built by a builder yeah like all of the pre-design effort right right so Greg uh, add to that from your point of view <clears throat> We may have lost him. Mr. Lavardera, to the microphone, please. <laughs> Sorry, I had muted muted myself there. So <laughs> uh, it's in slurping on my cup. But I, I was going to take a slightly different tact in that um, at times I'm operating with in in both worlds. In that you know I've I've done custom designed homes um, you know with local clients, um, and I've um, Done, I'll say custom design homes as as a non-architect in that I've I've modified my own house plans for particular customers that might be in another part of the country. Um, they might be building an estate where I'm not registered, so you know technically I'm not acting um, you know in the capacity of an architect for them. I'm acting as a you know residential designer or whatever you might call it. Um, so what what really distinguishes the two, you know, is is Mark described. You you do all of that, you know, background to learn about your client, to learn about this might be the a preferences. Case study for the wireless connection and a wired connection here. I wonder which one he's on. I I'm on a um, wired DSL connection with a, I, a I hear you fine, Greg. I'm you're oh, coming yeah, okay. fine I, for me. Yeah, I have a um, Ethernet cable, but I don't have great bandwidth on the, in in my office. So, so the, next, so the outcome uh, of that custom I... design process is oh. is you know a house that is very particular to to that client's lifestyle. Every everything can be tailored to you know their preferences and you know the way they aspire to live in a home. But when you're working with a stock house plan, everything is is more generic. Um, you know, people come shopping for a house that way, looking for a house plan that they think they can fit into rather than the house fitting to them. And even if you go ahead and modify it for some reason for them, 
it, it's never the same as as that in, entire creation of the house. Now, I have I think there's one house plan in my catalog which is a um, a local custom design that that cu client agreed we should attempt to sell their house design as a house plan. And if you look at the the floor plan, it's so much more unusual and very specific to their lifestyle compared to one of my um, catalog house plans. Um, just that whole interaction with the owner generates a much more different floor plan. Okay, very good. Um, Gregory, you recently put a post up about uh, your Arkansas Platte House and this this is really a question about uh, the, going back to the comment that you made on influencing the home design market as a whole, can you elaborate on on that? And, and you, if it was my understanding that you saw how uh, one of the builders in the same area where you had done this custom uh, house yeah. called the Arkansas Flat House had kind of copied it and and took it to another level. Yeah, they um, the builder. Um, of one of my customers' uh, houses, <clears throat> I guess they had built a, a house on spec that they have on the market, and, and my customer sent me a fi picture of it and said, "Hey, look, you know the guy that built our house. Now they've done this, and uh, it it wasn't it wasn't something like they've copied my design. It was nothing like that. The the house that um, my customer built was a long horizontal, you know, bar shaped house, but it had a shed roof with a metal roof and had." Um, beams that stuck out that supported the cantilever of the roof. Well, this house that the builder built had a very similar roof line in that it had a, a, a shed roof with a metal roof and these similar overhangs, but it was a, a square assemblage of, of these shed roofs all going different directions. But it was clearly influenced from you know the other design. So I was thrilled, like here's a, a builder that might have never um, tried a, a contemporary styled house in his market. Um, you know, saw two of my customers lived on the same street there that had modern houses, and he thought, "Well, I'll, I'll try that and see if uh, I can sell it." And, <laughs> and that's where he is. Um, mm -hmm. He's built that house and has it on the market. So, I thought that was just great. Most sincere form of flattery, right? Yeah, and that, and then in some ways, that was the goal: was to, you know, expose the a, the wider market to better design, and then influence that to improve it. Now. That that may mean that more people go to architects to get better design, but it also just might mean builders and residential designers being pressured to step up uh, the level of their work. That's great, Mark. Ha how about you? Have you noticed any ripple effect like that from your projects going on? No, no. But I but I uh, I I commend uh, Greg and what he's doing. I think um, I think more architects should be designing house plans. It's something that we'd we've been talking about doing for a long time and just never have done it because it does take a lot of time, as I'm sure Greg can attest to, um, right. to kind of get those designs up and running when you don't have a client breathing down your neck to do it. You kind of have to motivate yourself to do it. Um, and I, and I, it, it's funny because Greg, and I don't know if Greg will remember this, but on, on Entrepreneur Architect a long time ago before it was relaunched years ago, um, I featured Greg as really one of the first uh, entrepreneur architects uh, on on the blog as you know an example of an architect doing something other than traditional architecture. Yeah, that mm -hmm. reminds me. Um, in just trying to make this a uh, this hangout a jumping point for you to look at other uh, content uh, from these guys, uh, podcasts and blog posts and whatnot. Uh, check out Enoch Sears on on the business of architecture. I think it's five or six episodes back he interviewed Greg. And uh, they do touch on it about how much time it took him to get that first set of plans up to where he was comfortable with putting it online. So it is no small uh, feat to, to take that on. But I think that another thing that we as architects might have working against us on taking that step is, is sort of a, uh, a stigma, I guess, if you would. Uh, we, we sort of have... It seems from the conversations I see online, we sort of have a, an aversion uh, to people who aren't architects offering these plans, and we feel like if we do the same thing, we might be lowering our standards a little bit. Uh, what What do you guys think about that? Go ahead, Greg. Well, 
I, I've had my fair share of you know flack for uh, for venturing into the the house plant world, but I I maintain that it it doesn't it does not steal custom commissions from from architects and and rather it attracts people to better design who would never in the first place had had hired an architect, but they come out of that process you know so convinced about you know wow something unique we can make something better and I and I believe it breeds more future clients uh, custom clients for architects so uh, what's your take Mark? You know my I mean if anybody follows entrepreneur architect they know that my whole mission is to get architects to, to break out of the box and to think beyond the traditional architecture firm so um, any work that's that's different than the traditional client hiring an architect and us sitting behind a computer and designing what a client wants, uh, I love. You know, I, I, because I think that market is so small for architects um, and so competitive, because you're not only competing against architects, you're competing against all those builders too and all the house designers. And so if architects can get their brain out of that mode, that that's the only way to do it and to think about other ways of doing it, um, they're going to be more successful, and the professional will be more successful, and will have more influence on society as architects. Yeah. I think the the, the challenge there. the challenge there has been um, really the cost of the cost of services, and um, you know, house plans. Okay, that's that's one solution, but but the the core of the problem is how how can we as architects deliver you know services for designing a home to uh, the customer for a price that they're willing to pay. You know, what does that mean? Um, I've known architects that essentially had a, ca a catalog of houses, not that they sold them, but it's something that they went back to um, to offer and alter for customers that came to them who clearly weren't, you know, um, in the market for for design services, you know, at the scale of 10 or 15 percent of construction costs. Um, and so for for you know just several thousand dollars they could uh, modify an existing design and gain a happy customer and so you know um, I feel like if we don't operate that way we're, we're really giving away the entire housing market to people who are less qualified yeah I couldn't agree more with you guys uh, if you're joining us late I'm Jeff Stafford with modus operandi design this is a big time small firm hangout number 13 uh, right now we're hanging out live on Google Plus or if you're watching this uh, later than Friday, July the 19th, you'll be seeing it on our YouTube feed. Uh, we're here with Mark LePage and Gregory Lavadera, uh, both leaders in the custom home uh, design market by our architects. I uh, want to move the conversation now to uh, one about building practices, uh, starting with uh, Greg, t tell us about what building practices you've seen uh, that stand the test of time and, and the test of uh, greenwashing versus true sustainable practices. Wow. <clears throat> okay. So that's a giant question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the United States, we're in this period of, I, I see a period of, of real, really broad experimentation with, with different kinds of construction techniques um, with the goal of being green and, you know, ultimately with the goal of being energy efficient. Um, driven more uh, by energy perhaps in, in the, the northern por portions of the country where the, the heating season really drives the design. So, you know, this is this is all like a very familiar routine to architects that are that do custom design. You you do something, uh, detail something in a project, and then the builder comes up to you scratching his head, and he, they don't want to do it that way. They want to do it the way they've always done it. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, or they'll do it just the way you said, but they'll apply many dollars on top um, in order to protect themselves because they don't. They don't know how long it's going to take them to do it. Um, they've never done it before. They don't know the subcontractor that they have to use, and they don't know if the guy's going to cheat them. And there's any number of reasons the builder might, um, you know, inflate the cost. So when we look at green building, it's really that same set of problems. And 
I think that we need to come at it in a way that leverages the the building expertise that builders already have. That means you know building with conventional framing, using the kind of insulation products that they already know how to use. Um, you know working with sequences that match um, the sequences that they use to build houses currently. Now, you know, th this, is, this is, I'm speaking to the, the wider housing market, builders that build houses without architects. I feel like um, in green building we need to establish standard wall systems that everybody can build without any special consultation because that's that's the way the housing market works. There's no architect looking over the shoulder of 90% of the houses that get built. So if we're going to have high-performing houses, we need high-performing wall details that don't require strict oversight by a designer. Mark, same question. Yeah, I think uh, one of the, the things Greg said that um, of builders building houses without architects, I think more architects need to build houses without builders. Um, you know, I think if, if, if there's a way to get the market to shift, it's uh, to get some of the you know, builders that are cooperative or have architects start their own construction companies and build it the way they want them to build. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, we've started construction management services, which is a far, uh, a far way uh, from, from full construction, but that's the first step is to, uh, you know, kind of take more control of the construction process, uh, get paid for doing it along the way, and, uh, and then eventually um, build a team of, of contractors that you do trust, that do respond to what you're trying to, uh, to achieve, and build that team and go out and build your own work. Okay. Um, and on that same concept when when you are talking about successful or successful building uh, materials or systems and sustainable uh, practices uh, do do some of those stand kind of stand on their own or, or are easier uh, than others to, to successfully implement into your designs or how much of them depend on the designer the detailing and the installer really to be a successful uh, Part of a of a whole building, starting with Greg. Okay, go ahead. Uh, that was that was another big question. I'm not sure I absorbed all of that. <laughs> I think well, what I'm trying to get at is you know with with all of this this experimentation that that you're talking about and that we're most of us are familiar with, and the the yeah. developments that are coming out of it. Um, do those systems are they are they something that once you do get a contractor and a subcontractor uh, on track with it and and building it uh, can it become you know after you get past that first step a successful piece in your design yeah or does does absolutely some, um, okay does some of these have like dependencies on your detailing and on the contractor's skill set. Yeah, no, I think absolutely. I, I mean, I, I don't think that there's, um, you know, something flawed with any any of these particular um, systems that that are, you know, I'm saying being experimented with. But I, but I think there's there's reasons why they don't take hold um, and and become widespread or become you know, quote unquote standard. Um, SIPS panels, you know, um, plywood skinned insulated panels. Uh, they're st structural. They replace stud walls. They, you can frame the walls, the roof out of them, provide very high insulation levels. They've been around for many, many years. And um, not to disparage them, but they've failed to replace the stud wall. And um, there's many reasons. There's, there's some things about them that are awkward or difficult to, to work with. Passing wiring through them always con continues to be a, sort of a, a strange uh, um, part of working with them. Um, but, you know, a contractor that's worked with them before and becomes facile with them can build with them very quickly for, for you know, at some point they pass that point where they perceive any, um, you know, liability or any additional time required to work with that system. And, you know, that contractor is in an outstanding position because they can be highly competitive with a high-performance system by working with SIPs. But, 
you know, at the same time, um, I mean, the proof of the pudding would be, you know, every merchant builder, um, you know, every every um, small home builder would be building houses with SIPs if if at some level um, it it was the ideal system. I mean, it, it may be a better system, but um, if it's not going to catch on in the market, um, it it doesn't really mean very much. Mark, from from your point of view, yeah, I um, I think. Two things that that have sort of become a standard for us, and and pretty much a standard in the region, uh, is high efficiency uh, heating and air conditioning equipment and uh, better insulation uh, techniques, and use, using foam and other types of uh, uh, sustainable, you know, uh, solution different solutions for insulation other than fiberglass baths. Um, those two things are have really become a standard for our firm and has, has really become accepted and almost expected by the client that the clients are starting to come to us and say these are the things that we want to happen uh, which means that they're learning about those things elsewhere and it's and it's becoming mainstream so um, you know I think slowly over time these things will catch on I mean uh, photovoltaics had a huge jump uh, this past year, and then sort of started slowing down again because I still think they're not quite uh, efficient enough to 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 uh, uh, to, to um, benefit from a cost point of view. But they're almost there, and and there have been clients that have gone ahead with that. Um, geothermal uh, uh, heating systems is another thing that that there's a big upfront cost. So when the economy is bad. Uh, those things kind of go away, but when the economy was better, people started talking about those, and some clients have done done geothermal systems. And so, I think slowly they're catching on, and the more people talk about them, the more they'll happen. Okay, yeah, Greg, I'm glad you mentioned SIPs. I think that that as a system was sort of what this question was. Uh, that concept was kind of what I was getting at because. As you said, once you know, if you can work with a contractor that's experienced uh, in in doing SIP construction, and he knows to tell the designer, okay, we need to figure out where where every switch and outlet and all of the wires are going to go, uh, and you design it and detail it to that level, uh, the SIPs can can work. But if you have the SIPs going up and you're trying to move electrical stuff, uh, going from your example, not so much. So that's uh, that's kind of what I was aiming for, and uh, so and now back to Mark. Um, uh, you were talking a couple of blog posts ago about mandatory construction administration stuff. Right. Uh, yeah. Can you touch on that and and sure. how you've been able to uh, uh, convince your clients that you're not trying to pull one over on them, and and that in fact it is the best way to do their project. Sure. It, it, uh, it's it's. I'm getting a little feedback. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but um, one of the one of the things that that we've done is we've we've made it mandatory. We haven't given it an option, um, and so it hasn't really been uh, an, a, an idea that we have to convince people of. If they want to work with us, um, it's part of our process. It's part of our proposal. It's not shown as a, as an additional piece. It's shown as part of our process. Um, and so it's very rare that we get clients to um, to, to push back on it. That that it's it, it's just part. Most most of our clients have not gone through this process before, so they don't know what to expect. And so um, I find that that many architects who uh, are are offering it as an option um, are getting pushed back on it because clients are looking at it as an option. If you're presenting it as part of your process and an integrate, integral part of the process and an important part of the process, um, then they don't question it as much. And so our projects, it, it's not an option. It's uh, it's part of our process, and we've turned projects down um, uh, from clients who've who've wanted to pull it out and make it additional serve, you know, a, a, an additional piece. We feel the problem with that is that you lose control during construction, and from a marketing point of view. That's the most critical phase of our entire process. That when when your project that you spent all that time on uh, and the client has paid all that money for goes into somebody else's hands to execute and you're not involved with it, 
you've just you just let go of it and you've lost control of it. Um, and when things go bad, the first person they point to to blame is the architect who's not sitting in the room. And so it's it's a it's a requirement for us to be involved during construction. Yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty uh, great way to look at it, and I think it's also a common theme I've heard uh, from you and from the guys at Arca Speak, and and in a lot of other situations where. Uh, you know, there's kind of horror stories about when the architect gets cut out of that phase. So, uh, good job and good example that you're setting for the rest of us there. Um, going back to Greg, uh, after right after the convention, uh, one I did not go to Denver uh, AIA 2013, but I did attend uh, as many of the virtual uh, sessions that I could, and and kind of walked around with my little virtual reality avatar and, and did the virtual expo which was you know if you can't go be there in person it was a decent substitute. Did you visit the entrepreneur architect booth? I, I did and I, I grabbed all of your uh, brochures and and everything uh, you had some pretty prime real estate there right there. Yeah right on the, the corner I was, the I was happy with that. Yeah so that looked good I mean I thought it was a pretty cool way to experience you know some bit of the uh, uh, convention without going but what I wanted to ask about and and specifically Greg um, one of my favorite uh, sessions was the prefab refab prefab session mm. and it was the guys from Blue Home and the guys from uh, Mod Pod which is uh, a couple of really kind of I guess as the AI sees them cutting edge uh, prefab architects and to follow up on that I posted a video that I found uh, from a guy who was doing a TED talk, and um, I think that video struck a, co a chord with you, Greg, because uh, after I put it up on on Google Plus, you you pretty much ripped it, and so and I really thought you I wasn't posting it for like uh, you know for better or for worse, but I think you had some really good points about how prefab is being used and used well rather than just like a a kind of, uh, you know, uh, what's the word, novelty, uh, where, you know, you use a computer and you print out a bunch of rep repetitious pieces with mutations in each uh, one yeah. and kind of piece it together. Can you talk about that? I'm, I'm trying to remember what video it was, but it, it must have Jess, I think you muted Greg. Yeah, I was trying to get rid of that. Uh, that feedback I was hearing. Apparently, when you click and re-click that button, it doesn't unmute somebody. I think we may have lost this connection. Oh, he's coming back. There he is. My hangout rebooted. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, we we heard you say you um, before you cut out. We heard you say that you weren't sure which uh, which video it was. It was a yeah. I'm assuming it was something with yeah. It was about uh, like a CNC cut plywood <laughs> project. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah, I, I, I just think that that particular, that, that, that's almost like a meme within the, the uh, off-site um, building um, interests that, you know, somehow it's going to be great to cut everything for a house out of plywood and be able to, you know, bring a mobile mill to the site and cut out all these parts and just quickly put the house together, which just seems totally preposterous to me. I mean, there's so much waste on each sheet of plywood with all these odd pieces that they cut out and <laughs> you know I, I the, the fact that that might be competitive with a you know with a um, in, industrial plant making plate nail trusses or fabricating you know uh, wall panels uh, on a um, assembly line or something is 
really just strikes me as preposterous. It's to me, it's complete a complete fetish with the process, and and uh, not at all a, a real viable way to go about you know building building houses. Maybe to build a a, a highly designed, unique um, you know uh, structure as sculpture. Great, knock yourself out. But but they seem people involved with it seem to think that this is a, a model for the housing industry for, to build houses at a large scale and uh, it, I just think it's preposterous so <laughs> so I that's probably a, I, I you know I, I, now that you mentioned it I remember making some comments there but uh, it, <laughs> I guess it's become so routine with my thinking I didn't even remember that particular time <laughs> okay uh, yeah, I was going to try to find that post so I could maybe you made some really good points in it. But in the meantime, uh, Mark, have you used any sort of prefab uh, means and methods in, in your designs or seen any or, or have any uh, convictions one way or the other with, with the no, we, movement? No, we've explored it for a few clients. Um, we also designed a small house that we, we were considering uh, selling as a, as a kit house. Um, but the costs couldn't get to where we wanted them to be for the for the the value you were going to get, so we, we never proceeded with it. Um, but I think you know I like the idea of a prefab house. I like I like what Blue Homes is doing. Um, I think it takes a tremendous amount of. I was pretty impressed with with what they were able to come up with uh, using the pre-constraints of a f shipping with a flatbed truck yeah. and uh, a really funny story that the Blue Homes guys told is that they shipped the whole house uh, to this one site which was pretty remote and hard to get to on a flatbed truck and uh, they ordered a, this house also they ordered a big custom uh, like refrigerator or like commercial big commercial size refrigerator for this custom kitchen and the appliance company said they couldn't get that <laughs> to the site where, you know, to this home that had been completely delivered on a flatbed truck. And so I thought that was mm. pretty ironic. Um, so it's just uh, like Greg said, I think it's, you know, watch, watch out for the design, uh, but at the same time, you know, don't get infatuated with the process to the point to where you know, you're just wasting a bunch of plywood, and it really reminded me of an associate uh, associate dean uh, at Mississippi State University, Christos Sarkopoulos, a uh, Greek architect, uh, who was there when back when I was going through school, and he had a custom furniture design line, and uh, he impressed upon me the kind of uh, efficiency, Greg, that I think you were talking about there. He would make complete. Uh, pieces of furniture out of one or one and a half pieces of four by eight plywood. Uh, so the idea was to design the cuts and the shapes of the pieces to where uh, the only waste would be, you know, that blade width of, of whatever shape you were cutting out and assemble the shapes and, and nest uh, the design in such a way that you used every bit of the wood. So uh, I think there's, there's a lot of merit to design in that way and, and let the material uh, you know, inform inform what you're doing with it. But it was really yeah. interesting to see what he came up with. You know, it was uh, a lot of the shapes were odd and uh, you know, really just very basic geometric shapes in order to get that effect. But to uh, to kind of build on that basic geometry, he painted everything primary colors. You know, so it it was almost romper roomish. But once you saw his design drawings and the way. He nested mm -hmm. everything and, and cut everything to get zero waste. Uh, you really started to see what it was about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, you so, can certainly take that approach with uh, you know cutting plywood components to build a house, but um, I think um, that particular example that you mentioned uh, um, had such variety. I mean, they were they were leveraging the 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 strength of the C, the computer you know controlled cutting device that you could make such specific pieces and e make each one unique um, to arrive at a really sculptural result but of course that also is the source of so much of the waste of the process I mean right. that make may make sense for making a unique edifice like that but 
clearly if you're going to be producing something, a product and an assembly line, you wouldn't want to have that kind of uh, waste associated with each piece you made. Yeah, I don't think that's the next wave of uh, housing manufacturing. No. Yeah, it's, it's <clears throat> more like sculpture that you can actually yeah. live in. <laughs> yeah, we, but this is like the emperor's new clothes and you know when parts of our profession make these claims and, and present these things, it's up to us to you know, call them out. Otherwise, they drag down all of our credibility. <laughs> I mean, I, I think the concept of prefab is, is valid. I, you know, I, I think the idea that Blue Home has, that where they're designing real homes and they're building them in factories at a very efficient, in a, in a very efficient manner, um, getting them to the site and, and assembling them very quickly, um, I think that that concept certainly has merit. Um, there's no cost savings there, though. If you talk to Blue Homes, I, I interviewed Carl Daubman on the podcast. The cost of those homes are no less than a stick belt home. Um, yeah. You know, their their claim is that they're built better and that they're and that they're on site quicker. They're assembled quicker. Um, but that's you know that's a, that's it. I you know, I think from a concept, it's it's a pretty interesting concept. But I don't think it's going to take over you know traditionally built homes. I, I think what is um, <clears throat> remarkable about Blue Homes is the amount of investment they've managed to uh, to garner for yeah. what they're doing. Tremendous uh, amount. Yeah. Yeah. I I think anybody that's studied uh, prefabricated techniques and and uh, um, performance construction um, would have uh, reservations about you know what they're doing and and the way they're doing it. Um, you know, you mentioned in your your uh, preparation sheet, Jess, you wanted to talk a little bit about the study of Swedish construction that I've done and um, one of the things that's remarkable about the Swedish housing market is that like 95% of their houses are built with an industrial method. Some of them are modular, um, some are just done with a highly controlled supply train, um, uh, but the majority of them are built panelized and are built off-site. Um, their process is very efficient, and they leverage the 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 process of building off site to incorporate more value into the walls, because it's easy to do when you're working in the factory. So that what that translates into is much better house performance for um, less relative cost. Um, they're, they're able to build a very complex multi-layered wall system that perf performs extremely well um, for much less money that you could build such a wall system in the field. And so essentially they're, they're leveraging the fact that they're building off-site to deliver more value to the customer. And I don't see that going on with uh, the kind of uh, processes that are done with off-site building here. Even, I mean, Blue Homes they, they fold up their modules. It's not that much different than any uh, modular builder in the United States. Um, and the clue there is that you, you can watch videos. If you visit a, a, the website for a factory, you can watch videos of their factory. Here we are building a house in, in, in our factory. And you know you have a, you know, the trained eye. You know construction processes. And um, all they're doing is building a house under roof. You know, there and there's a certain advantages to that. All your materials are there. You don't have to run out to the hardware store. You don't have to, you know, unload the truck. So there, there are some advantages there, but you can only squeeze so much efficiency out of out of that advantage of being under roof. Yeah, um, you eventually have to I, ship that. Right, and when I look at when I look at the same, you know, activities, construction activities in the factory in Sweden. I'm, they install their windows completely differently. They install their windows in a way that is manufactured. Not they're not simply installing a window the same way you do it on site, because except that you're indoors. Um, so that 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 level of refinement has come through cooperation between component manufacturers and manufacturers. You know, the window manufacturers have changed the way they make windows to facilitate them being installed the way that the, build, the builders want to install them in the factory. And we are nowhere near beginning to have that cooperation between our component manufacturers and our factories, not not least bit. I see. Yeah, thanks for picking that back up. I, I breezed over that in my notes. So we've got about five minutes left. 
And I do have a question from Paul Setti, uh, who joined us on. If Paul, if you're still on, I'm going to ask this from your chat question. Uh, what portion of CA is required, going back to the mandatory uh, construction administration from ARC? And he says that uh, he's got a segmented uh, contract services uh, in his agreements. So uh, structural shell and coordination is required, and all other coordination is optional service. So, Mark, do you want to uh, address uh, Paul? And, and Paul, if I think I'm, uh, or Phil muted you earlier. If you can unmute, maybe y'all can have a discussion about that. But remember, we just have about five minutes left. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I can hear you. Is the um, tw uh, construction administration is about 20% of our total total fee, our total process. Um, we break our, our fee down 25, 25, 25, 5, and 20. Um, and so a big chunk of our fee is up front. Um, and then uh, construction administration is 20% is of it. We're only residential, and so um, we're involved in, in the entire process of construction. We have weekly meetings with the, with the owner and the contractor. Uh, we, re we review contractor payment applications. Um, uh, we're there to resolve design issues as they come about, you know, for unforeseen conditions and things like that. Um, so that's pretty much our process. Do you have a, a specific, uh, any other specific question? No, it was just in. It's it it, it we broke it out. I'm residential as well. Yeah. And in my experience, it was always hard to get a client to buy into that need. And without a good builder support system who believes in the system. Right. Yeah, that's a big part of uh, it. You know, it, it made it more uh, more of a challenge. But when you had that support from the builder side, it always made it a lot easier. And usually the builders like to doubt no change orders and things like that. At the end, the project is huge cost because of changes that were never documented and and so I, I do the same thing you know I coordinate pay apps and whatever and I'm a big proponent of change orders and making sure the builder puts right. in a change order for time and delays as well as credits yeah to the owner as well as everything you pay extra for and uh, the home, this way the homeowner has more of a chance to grasp uh, their 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 project and their money and they're more deeply involved. I've always found that, you know, the homeowner doesn't want to necessarily save money. They want to know where else they can spend it. So they can buy a more expensive lamp in the end as opposed to something else if they just knew there was a credit. Um, so th that was it. And, and and I normally just put in as a required option just for code conformance and structural conformance and things like that as required and let that be a feeder into the other uh, processes just to help convince the homeowner, you know, yeah, it's needed. Yeah. Let the builder see it. Yeah, it's needed. <clears throat> because there's so many other coordinations, electrical trims, things like that, that are just unforeseen until you're out there. Right. So, yeah, I'm, so one of the big things. Question. Oh, sorry, go I, ahead. I just, just, there's two other things. One, one of the things Paul said was that you get to get support from contractors. That's really important. If you work with similar, you know, the same contractors over and over again, after the first project, they realize the benefit they have by having you involved. And so when they start saying to the con to the client during the bidding process, they want to know whether we're involved or not, that's, that's a big help. The other piece is to make sure you have great references because the clients who have been through that process now understand why it was important after the process. Very few of them understand the importance of it up front, but many of them, or all of them, for in our case, understand when it's finished uh, why it was important for us to be there because we, we not only while we're doing it we're also reminding them while we're doing it why you know here's you know and it's not so blunt it's kind of subtle but we remind them of you know here's what we're doing for you and, and here's why we're involved during construction so, so when you references are called um, they can support you for that we have uh, one more question uh, we, we are we'll go a little bit over but I'll try to keep it to just about five minutes over uh, because after uh, I asked this last question. I wanted to get each of you to give uh, us young starting out architects, especially those like me that have gone from a career of uh, doing like uh, commercial and institutional work to, to really uh, 
changing the residential part of it from a sketch hobby and, and things that you do for friends into a part of a major part of the business. Uh, but this question's from Phil, uh, who I'd also like to thank as as the moderator of Big Time, uh, one of the co-moderators of Big Time Small Firm with me. Uh, he's got a question for Mark about what other than cost is the biggest misconceptions that you find people have about architects? Yeah, cost is a big one, yeah. Um, I think probably the biggest thing is the value that you get, you know, in, in the bottom, you know, at the end. When you know, when the project is finished and they're living in their house, um, that's hard to uh, quantify, but it's something that I think that, that happens in an architect design project, um, we're literally changing people's lives by the by the, with the work that we're designing, um, and I don't think clients understand that. I don't think the majority of our society understands the value of the architect. Um, so I would say that's probably one of the biggest. Okay, thanks. That's a big one. All right, so. Greg, what's what's your golden egg to you know to to like yeah. bequeath to us? I think well, you mentioned you know you made that transition from working uh, you know on commercial work now in this practice doing smaller scale work. I made that same transition. I you know when I worked um, elsewhere, I worked on institutional projects, uh, you know public bids. Uh, with all of the you know the rigmarole that came came along with that you know writing um, non proprietary specifications in those situations and managing uh, you know design processes and construction administration processes that were very paperwork laden and when you come out of that like you're ejected out of that into dealing with homeowners on you know a very personal basis it's like you have to be prepared to sort of scale back that that compulsion to document everything and ah. you know you, you still need records of course because you want to have you know um, records in case uh, you know disagreements or disputes with the contractor arise but you really have to seek that appropriate level um, you know you, you don't want to hand a, a house builder you know a set of drawings that have a, a a, a giant specification book along with <laughs> if they're not accustomed to doing that kind of work. Now, granted, there's there's you know luxury custom homes built that have you know document sets that have 75 sheets in them. But you know for for the clientele that that you know I encounter in my practice, you know you're talking about um, being able to build a house from you know uh, 10 or less sheets of drawings, and so. Um, you have to you have to to um, you know find a way to get the most essential information to you into the documents in a way that is um, you know not intimidating and not overcomplicating the project for for the contractor that may not be accustomed to you know deciphering all the intentions of, of a designer so okay. it, and and that was a lesson that was hard learned for me you know through several projects and then you know I found myself in a place with a, a system and a, and a routine where producing documents were very efficient got great reviews from builders they felt their answers the answers to the questions they had were always in the documents and um, and yet they were getting a fairly concise set that wasn't intimidating so you know there's some like I, I was a big student of um, Edward Tufte, I don't know if, if anybody's familiar with the name, he's a statistician from Yale that wrote a series of books about, um, what was the title? The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. And so it was really all about how to communicate visually and um, temporal displacement. When you have a reference bubble on one drawing that sends you through the documents to another drawing, that's a displacement that delays giving the contractor information. So in my documents, wherever I could, I, I try to get the information right there where you want to convey it. So um, you know, for, for average residential projects, I strive to not have finish schedules, not have door schedules, not have window schedules. All that information goes directly into the plan, into the elevation, so that you know, 
when I want to know what size that window is, I don't have to flip to another page. It's right there on the window. When I want to know yeah. what the finishes are in that in that bedroom, it's right under the room title in the bedroom. And and so you know it it just makes things very immediate and uncomplicated, even though there's a very high level of information being you know conveyed. The drawings become very dense. Um, and I think the typography you use becomes very important and you start to be able to assign hierarchy of information by the way you display, you know, language on the drawing. And so it's very, you know, it's very designer-ish, it's very architect <laughs> thinking about all those little decisions that go into documents. But um, so I, I have, a, you know, a routine for my documents that are, you know, has a very dense amount of information on very few sheets, and it's very sort of transparent and very immediate. All right. Now, Mark. <laughs> yeah, that, Greg, is excellent advice. Excellent <laughs> advice. Um, I, you know, I think not only is it uh, a great way to put together a set of drawings and, and help build buildings better, but you're going to make more money that way. Is that when when you're not putting together all that additional information that you don't need, you're spending less time, and when you're building systems to do all those things, you're spending less time. And if you're spending less time, you have a potential to make more money. And that's you know, if you know me at all, that's going to be my message: is to business. Um, you're not going to be able to practice your art. And so my message to everybody every time you'll talk to me is going to be to build a better business. Um, and, and don't forget you need to make a profit on every job in order to make the, go to the next one. So Profit is a good thing. It is. We have to stop <laughs> being afraid of advice. that. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Greg, your, uh, your advice reminded me of a build blog post that I saw way back when, like a couple years ago, about uh, putting the specifications on the drawings along, you know, with the lean approach that you're talking about uh, that's been yeah. developed. That, uh, that was actually a uh, one of the other sessions that was in the virtual convention was practicing lean architecture, and I think it was the... Uh, I can't remember the fellow's name, but I did post that video that I simulcast in, in our playlist on YouTube. But it's Practicing Lean Architecture is what it's called, and right. it, it's from RTKL. Uh, I do remember their firm, but that was some of the same uh, types of approaches that make a lot of sense. You know, let's maximize yeah. our information conveyed on, on this piece of paper, and, you know, we can put more than one size scale of drawing on the same sheet and have elevations and sections and you know plans lining up to where everything sort of reads well so that's good right. well, before yeah. we cut uh, we can just talk the uh, afternoon away and and uh, let this go too long I wanted to say thank you guys and uh, I really appreciate your time and and the information that you've shared with us and I hope that the, the folks who were uh, watching on on YouTube get get as much as I did out of this and uh, Keep in mind that part two of Custom Homes with uh, Neil Pan and Nicholas Bernard is going to be on Wednesday at 9 p.m. And uh, we're going to try something new. It's going to be uh, hopefully the broad width, the bandwidth will, uh, will support it. We're going to do a Twitter uh, or a Twitter chat with the old entrepreneur architect hashtag and uh, team that up with the Google uh, Hangout. So that'll be a fun thing. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, this is Jess uh, with Big Time Small Firm signing off, saying goodbye for Mark LePage. Thanks, Jess. Gregory LaVardera. Thank you, guys. My, thanks so much. My co-moderator, Phil Hesketh. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Greg. It's been great. Really thanks, informative. Phil. And our visitor, Paul Setti. Thanks for doing this. Sorry I was late. All missed right. out on some good stuff. Well, you can always go to YouTube and see the what you missed. So it'll be posted up there, and I'll put a link on the event. Awesome. Uh, and I'll say goodbye for, for Nicholas Renard, who joined us, but he had to go for a meeting. Uh, and Nicholas, remember that you can catch this uh, late half on YouTube anyway. So everybody have a good weekend, and goodbye. That's it.